Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to Women in the Word. My name's Amy Foster. I just love being with you here every week, love being with those of you who are watching remotely, so thanks for joining us. Um, we're gonna talk today about faithfulness and endurance in hard times, and Paul certainly knows a thing or two about hard times. We know from the history of his life that multiple times he's been beaten and whipped and scourged and drug out of town and left for dead and shipwrecked and arrested and imprisoned. Um, we maybe have never experienced any of those things. Timothy probably hasn't experienced any of those things yet, but Paul believes Timothy and all of us have something to learn about endurance. So he writes this letter to his dear, beloved child, Timothy, and he writes from prison. We talked about this quite a bit last week. This is his second imprisonment in Rome, but his first imprisonment was somewhat gentle. It was more of a house arrest, and his friends came and went. Um, this time is very different. He's a prisoner of the Roman Empire. He's chained. He's in a dungeon. He's really feeling all alone as the majority of his friends have abandoned him. And Paul knows that his days are numbered. He knows that he's facing execution because Christians are being killed in the Roman Empire in pretty barbaric ways, and their leaders are being targeted. And so, as is often the case when that happens, people start shrinking back. They start stepping away from those leaders and stepping away from the name that will bring persecu persecution. And that's what's happening as Paul's writing this letter. And in spite of all of that, he writes to his beloved child, Timothy, Timothy, be strong. Timothy, be faithful. Timothy, endure suffering. Wow, amazing words. And I'm just gonna be honest with you, if I were Timothy and all those things were happening, I'd be shrinking back. And I'd be saying, boy, I didn't sign up for this. This is not the story I want to be a part of. You know, I think many of us react that way to struggle and suffering. Years ago, I went through a season of suffering. And I'll just tell you, all I wanted every day was for the suffering to stop. After about two years, things took a turn, and instead of stopping, it was very clear that uh, the situation was going to become more difficult, and all I could think was, I can't do this anymore. I'm so tired. I have no strength. I don't want to do it. And I bet if we took the time, every one of you could stand up and tell your story and tell your experience where you've thought the same thing. I don't want to do it anymore. I'm just too tired. Around this time, some sweet friends took me on a trip to New York, and the highlight of that trip, we did a lot of great things, but the highlight, we visited a very vibrant church in Harlem. Now, this was not the hip, cool, gentrified portion of Harlem that we went to. It was an old, worn out, rough part of Harlem, but this church had a significant recovery program for people who were addicted to drugs. And the members of that recovery program uh, participated in a gospel choir. And so we went on this day to worship with this choir and the songs were all about struggle and suffering and I could relate to their music. And one particular song, I remember it to this day, it was called Just One More Trial. Just one more trial and the message was, this world is just a series of trials and difficulties. And as you sat in this really hard, broken down, worn out neighborhood and you saw their worn out faces and you knew their stories had been hard, you could really understand that. But then like all the other songs, it turned to this jubilant benediction, but one day, one day it won't be like this. There's another world waiting for us, and in that world, Jesus is on his throne. The people in that choir were looking forward to eternity, and that's what would sustain them, that's what would give them hope, that's what would allow them to break this stronghold of Satan in their life, and the same thing would be true for me, an eternal perspective, looking forward to God's future, that would give me hope, that would help me break, fear, break free from fear and wanting to quit. Paul had that perspective too, it was an eternal perspective and so he writes to encourage Timothy and to develop that perspective in Timothy and his message is really, Timothy, lift your eyes from all these things that are happening right here. Lift your eyes from this terrible stuff that's even happening to me in prison and instead rest your eyes on the glories of your God. Rest your eyes on his beautiful plan. 
Rest your eyes on his eternity. These are the things we're supposed to look to, and these are the things that help us to endure. So you may remember in, in chapter one of this second letter, Paul, he ends that letter with everyone who was with me in Asia has abandoned me. Everyone, that is not a picture of endurance and faithfulness. But chapter two, he writes really a total contrast. And he writes to show the folks who, who don't abandon, what do they look like? What does it look like to endure and be faithful? So read with me, Second Timothy chapter two. We're gonna begin in the very first verse. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. It is the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. So he begins this passage really with a command to be strong or be strengthened. And I love that this isn't a command to find strength within yourself, draw on your own strength here. Instead, it's a command to be empowered by God to have spiritual power that comes from God that will strengthen you. And it's also not written as a one-time only event. It's written as an ongoing experience. Continue being strengthened in God. And he actually calls it the strength that comes from the grace that is in Christ Jesus. So I want us to talk about that strength for a moment. You know, we've talked about grace a lot here. Grace is a gift. We don't earn it, we don't work for it, and we don't even deserve it, but we simply receive it as God offers it to us. All of you, like me, can probably say, as a, a sinful person, to be able to have a relationship with a holy God, that's just grace. That's something he's just given to me. But God doesn't stop there with his grace because when we have a relationship with him, it says we dwell with Christ, his spirit is in us. And that's a grace too, isn't it? Because I don't deserve to have God's spirit in me. And he puts that spirit in me so I can draw from it. Grace is also this enabling thing where all of God's great resources have been put in me if I will draw for them. So grace is undeserved favor that gives us a relationship with God, but grace is also this undeserved enabling that allows us to draw from God's great resources. We draw from his strength, we draw from his wisdom, we draw from his great love that he puts inside us. You know, I've told you before, I've, I've raised three boys, and when the boys were little, anything around the house that required strength, I did it, because they were little boys. And if it was too hard physically for me to do it, it literally didn't get done. But one day, and it seemed like it happened overnight, I looked around, and those little boys were suddenly bigger than I was, and they were suddenly stronger than I was, and I had this aha moment. There was strength in my house, and it wasn't coming from me. And that was a great reality to see, but I had to act on that. I had to decide, I'm not gonna rely on my inadequate strength anymore. I'm going to rely on their strength. And I know that's a really limited illustration, but I think it's the same thing that Paul is trying to teach Timothy here. I think he's telling him, Timothy, there's strength in your house, and it doesn't come from you, but you have to draw on God's strength. That's what he's talking about with this strength that comes from God's grace. So Timothy would draw on that strength over and over and over again, and that's how he would continue, and that's the same way we continue. You know, Paul describes that strength in his own life over and over and over again. Look on your verse sheet, 1 Corinthians 15, 10. He says, and I worked harder than any of them, but it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. And then his famous uh, lines about endurance from Philippians 4.13, you know, this is that passage where he says, it doesn't matter if I'm well-fed or hungry, uh, cold or well-cared for. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So he begins with be strengthened, continue strengthening yourself, and then he moves straight into and continue the ministry. Because Paul knows that he's facing the end of his life and that means it's the end of his earthly ministry and so he's giving this charge now to Timothy. 
Timothy was to take this gospel message and he was to entrust it to others who could also teach. He's probably referring to the elders there at the church in Ephesus. And I love that in this instruction we see a reminder, Timothy's not alone. He's not the only one carrying this gospel message around. There are others in the battle with him. And the word entrust is used over and over again in, in all of Paul's writing to Timothy. So I wanna stop and look at that for a minute. Um, first, the gospel was entrusted to Paul, then it was entrusted to Timothy. Now Timothy is entrusting it to others. And, and a trust was the same then as it is now. A trust is something you don't own, but you're charged to guard it and to protect it and to care for it and to move it forward so it will accomplish what the owner wanted. And so the truth here that Paul's communicating all through this is this is God's gospel. It's God's gospel and you've been entrusted with it. You are to use it and move it forward to accomplish God's purposes. Um, one author said, the church is simply an unbroken chain of teachers. And that's true, isn't it? Um, Paul was one chain, Timothy was one chain, and all of them together, even today, we make up this chain that is a progression that's moving the gospel to accomplish God's purpose which is people from every nation, every tribe, every generation, all gathered together as the kingdom of God. That's God's great plan for eternity, and he's going to use his faithful people here. So Paul begins, be strong, move forward in this ministry, and then endure hardship. This is the difficult part. The actual words there, um, your Bible maybe said endure suffering. One said take your share of the hardships and the sufferings. And again, there's a reminder in that word, take your share. You're not alone. You're not the only person suffering. You're not the only one who's ever struggled in this. And he says take your share as a good soldier. So again, that's that reminder. This is a battle. This is spiritual warfare and it has eternal consequences. And because these consequences are forever and eternal, don't shrink back. Don't shrink back, but take your share. Then he goes on and he gives this illustration of three different kinds of people. And these are each people who can press on in strength. And the reason they can press on is they have their eye fixed on something in the future, a future hope, a future dream. Um, and each one has their own way of pressing on in strength. He begins with the soldier. The soldier presses on in strength by not being overly burdened by the distractions and the difficulties of the world. Instead, he works with single-minded devotion. And his devotion is to please his superior, his commander. His devotion is to entrust what, has, what he's been given to handle. Next, we see the athlete, and the athlete has a distant end goal, and that goal is victory or a crown. And because of that end goal, the athlete, he chooses integrity and purity and obedience to the rules of the competition, to the rules of the preparation. And I had to stop and think, we saw a great example of this uh, just a few months ago in our Summer Olympics. We saw right before our eyes, athletes who've trained their whole lives, who broke the rules and they failed the test and they were banned from participating in the Olympics. And we saw others who trained according to the high standard that was set for them, who used integrity in their hard work and they were able to compete and they were able to win the prize. So that's a picture of someone willing to endure hard, disciplined, sustained work that rises to a very high level of obedience and someone else set that level of obedience for them. And last, he gives us a picture of a farmer, and we lose a little in our translation here because your Bible probably just said the farmer works hard, and that seems rather simple, doesn't it? The, the literal translation is he works to the point of exhaustion. That's the farmer who's up before dawn, and he's out after dark, exhausting himself. He works intensely, and he can do it because he's not thinking about the work and the sweat. He's thinking about the harvest, He's thinking about the beautiful benefit to come in the future. So in each illustration, you see a person who has their eyes set on an end goal and a future reward, and that's what enables them to pursue their goal and to work hard with integrity and to suffer and to sweat and to plant little tiny seeds, hoping they will flourish into something great. Do those illustrations remind you of anyone? Because they're supposed to. The church answer, it's always Jesus. That's who we see here. Jesus, 
the seed planter, the suffering servant, the obedient son, and the warrior savior straining for the eternal prize. Look at Hebrews 12 on your verse sheet. This shows you Jesus even had an eternal mindset. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So just like Jesus, we don't look at what's happening right now, today. We look to eternity, and that's how we endure. Read with me beginning in verse eight. And remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, is preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal. But the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. This saying is trustworthy, for if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. So he begins this passage with remember Jesus. That's one way we be strong. And, and Paul has taught so much about the character and the nature of Jesus. But in this passage, he just focuses on two specific characteristics. And the first is Jesus, remember he's resurrected from the dead. And here's the message there. Jesus is the rightful Lord. He's the Lord, he's the holy son of God who overcame death and hell. And because he's the Lord, he's the one who is able to offer us each salvation. And next he says Jesus is the offspring of David and the message there, he is the rightful king. He's the king that was prophesied who would sit on the throne forever. So he's the rightful Lord and he's the rightful King. He is the Messiah. Remember Jesus, that's the center of the gospel message. That's what Paul is saying here. The gospel message is Jesus, holy son of God who came to save sinners. And he's pulling those sinners in to his family and he's going to be with them forever. That's the gospel Paul has been teaching and as a result, he's in a prison and he's chained. And he's chained as a criminal. And this was so interesting to me. The word that is used for criminal in this passage, it's only used one other time in the entire Bible. It means evildoer. And it's the word that's used to describe the two men who hung on crosses beside Jesus. It means evildoer condemned to death. And Paul knows that's who I am now. In the eyes of the Roman government, I'm an evildoer and condemned to death because I'm remembering Jesus and I'm proclaiming his words. And that could look pretty bleak, couldn't it? If you didn't have an eternal perspective. But Paul does and he knows that he might be in chains and condemned, but the word of God is not. The word of God is not bound. That is the profound eternal truth that helps us to be strong. The message of the gospel will not be executed with Paul. There's an old saying, God buries his workers, but he continues his work. And that is true. The gospel is entrusted to men, but the gospel doesn't stop when the world stops men. I wanna remind you of Isaiah 48. This is on your verse sheet. It says, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. And that is Paul's eternal hope here. They can put me to death. They cannot stop God's word. And God's word doesn't just endure. It accomplishes God's plan for eternity. Also look at Isaiah 55:11. So shall my word be, it goes out from my mouth, it shall not return to me empty, but shall accomplish that which I purpose, and shall succeed in the things for which I sent it. So God speaks, and his words have power and can't be bound, and his words accomplish his purpose, and his purpose is the salvation of men, saving souls. 
Paul says, this is why I can endure, because God's eternal purpose is Paul's eternal purpose, and he wants Timothy to claim that as his eternal purpose as well. And as proof of that, he goes into this section here where he really describes four realities that he wants Timothy to remember in order to keep this eternal mindset. Um, Some of those realities are pleasant and wonderful and some of them are, are pretty terrible. So he begins with, if we have died with him, we will live with him. And so we know that what that means is when we choose to put our faith in Jesus and follow him, we die to our old self. We die to the sinful nature that we were born with and we choose instead to live in the new nature. And we get to live with that new nature now and we will live with Christ forever in eternity. The reality he's describing there is eternal life. Then he goes on and he says, and if we endure, we will also reign with him. And this is a little hard for us to wrap our heads around, but but God tells us that when we go to be with God forever, we will be co-heirs with Christ. Somehow, we participate in his reign and we participate in his glory. So that's a picture of eternal glory. Next, he says, if we deny him, he also will deny us. There's a few different interpretations of this passage. I'm inclined to believe he's talking here about a true unbeliever because that word deny means um, eternally deny, forever permanently deny. Um, So I believe he's talking about an unbeliever and Matthew 10, 33 tells us, whoever denies me before men, this is Jesus speaking, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. That's a picture of eternal rejection, eternal separation from God. That's a picture of hell. And I know we live in a day where we hear people say, well, I'm not gonna believe in a loving God who sends people to hell. I don't think that's a reality. Here's the reality. God gives us choices. He gives us choices every day. Some people choose to be away from God. Some choose to live completely separate from God. And when they die, God gives them exactly what they wanted, separation from God. And so that's a bleak picture of eternal rejection. Next, he says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. This also has various uh, interpretations. Some believe that faithless here means those who do lack saving faith, those who have never believed in Jesus. Others believe faithless here might be referring to lukewarm or carnal Christians um, who never really live from the, the spirit that is in them and never really mature, perhaps even turn away from the faith, but they don't lose their salvation. I'm not sure which of those is accurate. I think the second half of the passage is the one for us to focus on where it says Christ will be faithful. He's unchanging no matter what. He'll always be faithful and whatever we do doesn't change that reality. So we might be fickle, we might be faithless, we might be inconstant. Christ will not be. He will be faithful. And so either one of those first meanings, it could mean Christ will be faithful to save his own, or it could mean Christ will be faithful to judge those who deny him. And so I think the message there is eternal judgment. Everyone is judged in the end. These are the eternal realities that Paul wants Timothy to keep in the forefront of his mind so that he'll be willing to be strong, so that he'll be willing to suffer hardship and carry on. The realities of eternal life, eternal glory, eternal rejection, and eternal judgment. My husband has an expression that he uses, I'm not sure where it came from, but it's true, and he says, in this world, two things are eternal the words of God, and the souls of men. And that is a true statement. And I think that's the message we're getting here. Souls live on. They either live accepted by God or condemned by God. And that is an eternal reality that can keep us strong and committed to the gospel message. God's word will stand. God's word will call people into relationships with him. And that's the prize. That's the harvest, it's the first fruit, it's the crown, it's the victory. And it's a prize because it's everlasting. So we set our hope on that.
And so from that great assurance that God's word will not fail, God's word will continue to save souls, Paul goes on and he asks Timothy, now don't just be strong, Timothy, but also be faithful. Be faithful. Read with me beginning in verse 14. And he's talking to Timothy about the teachers that Timothy's entrusting and training up right now. He says, remind them of these things and charge them before God not to quarrel about words, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. But avoid irreverent babble. It will lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. They are upsetting the faith of some, but God's firm foundation stands, bearing this seal. The Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity." All right, so he's saying here, Timothy, be faithful, and to be faithful means to be confident that God's words are true. That's what faithfulness is, and I think it goes beyond that, not just confident that God's words are true, but to act accordingly, to act as if God's words are true. And he says, um, he reminds Timothy, remind these teachers not to quarrel with the false teachers, because those words, those false words, they lead to ruin, And so let's remember this false teaching stuff has come up all through these two letters to Timothy. False teaching is anything that perverts the gospel message, anything that adds to it, anything that diminishes it. It's also anything that is so confusing and unclear, it only leads to confusion and disorder and division. And over and over again, Paul has said, stay away from these debates, stay away from this teaching. He's told Timothy, don't study them, don't engage in the conversation conversation. So these leaders and our leaders today, we all need to be continually alert to the threat because false teaching has a capacity to actually tear down and ruin the hearers. And ruin there means eternal ruin, spiritual ruin. And Paul gives us this very vivid comparison. He says it's like gangrene which spreads and infects and corrupts and destroys. It mortifies. He's telling us false teaching can be deadly. You know, Matthew Henry about false teaching, he said, the way of error is always downhill. And that's a great reminder. It does not lead to anything good. So to be faithful, have nothing to do with it whatsoever. He mentions these two false teachers who've been spreading lies within the church. One is named Hymenaeus, not sure if I'm saying that right, and unfortunately, we've heard his name before. Back in 1 Timothy 1, Paul refers to him. It's the only two times he's mentioned in the Bible, and both times it's not good, so don't name your kid Hymenaeus. Um, (laughs) When we heard about him before, Paul had actually had to put him out of the church Because of his false teaching and the damage he was doing, Paul had to protect the church from his influence. Um, We don't know much about this Philetus, but we suspect he's just become a partner in crime with Hymenaeus here. Paul says, have nothing to do with it. Instead, that's the negative, but he says there's a positive. Instead, rightly handle the word of God. Rightly handle what has been entrusted to you. And when you do, you'll be free of shame. You'll be confident that you can stand before the one who's entrusted you with this gospel and have confidence and no shame. And both of these admonitions, both the don't have anything to do with the false teaching and the rightly handle the word of God, both suggest diligence and perseverance and vigilance. Now, the particular teaching that's been discussed here, they don't give us many details. It looks like it's a teaching that a bodily resurrection for believers was never going to happen. Um, If you remember, part of Greek philosophy, one philosophical view was that the body was evil. Anything physical was evil. So it looks like this teaching was probably that a Christian could expect when they put their faith in Jesus to experience a spiritual resurrection, but that was all. There would never be a bodily resurrection. That's most likely what they were teaching. 
Um, you may also remember that Jesus was pestered pretty regularly by some Jewish leaders who had this same philosophical view that the resurrection would not be possible and wouldn't take place. So when they're saying there's not going to be any resurrection, that's a really big deal because you and I understand the resurrection is central to the gospel message. That is a central theme to Christianity. And so that's a teaching that cannot be allowed within the church. And let's just think about it for a minute. If the physical body had been completely evil, how could our holy Lord Jesus have come to earth in a body? That's not possible. And we know that Christ's resurrection, it's taught to us that that is the proof that he was holy God. That's the proof that he was victorious over sin and death and hell, that he was enough to satisfy the penalty for sin and death and hell. So if his bodily resurrection hadn't happened, what does that mean for all of us? And then the rest of our New Testament teaching, Paul was teaching believers will also have a bodily resurrection one day. Look at your verse sheet at Philippians 3.20. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. That's the teaching that is true and right and good. And then look at 1 Corinthians 15, where in another part of the world, the same teaching is disturbing the faith. He says, now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. So this false teaching, it both undermines the gospel message and it totally distorts the personhood of Jesus Christ. And so that teaching has to be corrected. And Timothy's charge is be faithful to the words of God. Timothy, be faithful. You need to handle them rightly, you need to expose errors and you need to teach truth. And let's stop for a moment and consider why is that important? Why is it important to be faithful and to protect the words of God? It's the words of God, the gospel message that calls people into a relationship with him. And then it's the words of God that help us understand his nature, his character, who he is. And it's the words of God that guide us and instruct us about how we are to live. And it's the words of God that tell us what we can expect in eternity and give us our hope that is firm and steadfast. And so Timothy needs to be faithful and protect the words of God, and he needs to do that with this assurance that God's firm foundation will stand forever. Now the language is a little tricky here, but when, God, when it talks about God's firm foundation, it's talking about the church. Not a real building with walls, not, not a location or a place, but the universal church, he's talking about all of us, all of the people from all time who've put their faith in Jesus Christ and chosen to be his followers. We're the church and God is saying, Paul is saying here, the church will stand forever. The church will not fail. And so that's one reason you need to be faithful, Timothy. Look at 1 Peter 2, 9. This is a description of the church. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. God's going to be faithful to his church and he's going to keep it standing forever. God's going to do that and sort of as a proof to that, he says there will be two signs. There will two, be two seals or two markers that will always be present in the world to show you that God's church will always stand. The first is this, the Lord knows those who are his. God knows his own. That means God knows his own and he's calling them into a relationship with him. He's known them since before the foundations of the world. And even though there will be some people within the church who will be imposters, God's not fooled by that. God knows who are his. The word know there suggests intimate knowledge, intimate knowledge of their hearts and their souls and their minds and their motives. But it also means something else. It means possession. 
It means permanent ownership. So these people, you and me, and all of the other believers in the faith, we are, we are God's possession. We are his forever. That's why Jesus can say, no one can snatch you out of my hand. God knows his own, and when we come to him in faith, we are his forever. That's a sign in the world that the church will always stand. And that's a sign for our comfort, really. There's another sign. Those who name the name of the Lord will depart from iniquity. And what he means here is the true believer, the professing follower of Jesus, he'll be a changed person. He'll be changed. He'll be letting go of the old sin nature and he'll be reflecting Jesus more and more, pursuing holiness and pursuing godliness. Now we know that not all true believers will be faithful to this, but some will always because that will always be a sign in the world that the church of God exists and God will not let it fail. So Timothy can be faithful, he can look out, he can see those two signs as visible realities and trust that God is changing people and pulling them together in this church and protecting the church forever. And I love that we can see the same signs today. That hasn't stopped from the day Paul first taught this. All right, read on with me. We're gonna begin in verse 20. Now in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. All right, what he's telling Timothy here is not just endure and be strong, but be useful. Be useful, Timothy, because God is doing kingdom work. He starts with this picture of a great house. The great house is God's house, and that's the church. And he says, within the great house, some items are useful, and they're honorable, and other items are not useful, and they're dishonorable. And basically, he's saying, okay, Timothy, you're in the house, but you get to choose. Which one do you want to be? And there's an eternal truth that will guide Timothy's choice and our choice, and that is God is working in the world. God is working to save people, and he uses useful people. He uses honorable people in his house. So we know when someone comes to faith, it is all God's work. It's his doing. God puts faith in their heart. He quickens it and stirs it up. But we also know that God oftentimes does this in conjunction with useful people who teach and correct error and who demonstrate the gospel and who live the reality of a changed life in front of other people. So we're never responsible for the outcome, but God uses us, and so he says here, be useful, prepare to be useful. Be ready to undertake what God is calling you to do. And then he goes on to describe this preparedness. And there are some don'ts and there are some do's here. Um, among the don'ts, he says, separate from false teaching. Avoid the content altogether. When he says, cleanse yourself from all unrighteousness, and he's talking about cleansing yourself from what is dishonorable, he's talking about the false teaching. And you know, cleansing is complete. He doesn't say, rub it off a little bit. Clean, clean yourself up just a little bit. He says, no, cleanse yourself completely from it. That means have nothing to do with that false teaching. I, I don't know if you're like me, you might be getting a little tired of hearing about the false teaching and they don't have anything to do with it. Um, but we've got this great Bible study tool. When something is repeated over and over again in the scriptures, it's really important and we really need to listen to it. Four times just in this chapter do we get this command, stay away from the false teaching. 
Stay away from it, have nothing to do with it. I think what he means here is both to develop discernment and to, to develop discipline. You need to be able to identify false teaching and as soon as you've identified it, you need to step back and you need to stay away from it, stay far away from it. And so I think for us today, we have to stop and think. Um, are, are there authors or bloggers or teachers or pastors who we choose to follow, and, and maybe from time to time, yes, they do teach things that are contrary to truth. And I'm just confessing to you, I've had moments when I've thought, oh, I'm spiritually mature enough, I can continue listening to them, knowing that some things I need to discredit. That's not the instruction Paul is giving here. He's saying stay completely away from all of it. Separate yourself from it. That's how you prepare to be useful. Have nothing to do with it. And then the other things he says to stay away from, stay away from youthful passions. You know, this is the second reminder we have that Timothy is a youth, and that probably means mid-30s. Um, these words really suggest sins that the spiritually immature may be vulnerable to, sins like impatience, intolerance, self-assertion, pride, difficulty submitting to authority, and it also means sins like the lusts of the flesh things that can master our lives. And so I think what Paul's really saying here is Timothy, grow up spiritually. And he's saying that to all of us, grow up spiritually. If you stay a baby, you are not that useful to God. If you wanna be useful and honorable, you need to grow up. He says, don't be quarrelsome, don't be contentious. And isn't that curious in all this talk about false teaching that needs to be corrected, but don't be quarrelsome and don't be contentious. That's kind of difficult, isn't it? Um, he says, you don't need to engage in the conversation. You don't need to have a debate with these people. Just teach what is true. Teach the truth, Timothy. And then he goes on, those are the things Timothy is to avoid, and he goes on and he says, now I want you to pursue these things, pursue righteousness. That means right thinking that lines up with right behavior, and pursue faith. That's confidence in God's words and the ability to act on that confidence. He says, pursue love. That's growing affection for others. And you know the great reality there is that's that love of God that indwells you in his spirit that you draw from that. It's not your own love. And he says, pursue peace. That means fellowship and harmony. And then Timothy gets a great reminder. He's not alone in this. When Paul says, pursue these things along with everyone else who calls on the name of the Lord. And I just loved this, because here's what he's saying. The best place to develop these qualities in your life, it's here with other believers. The best place to learn to grow up spiritually is around other Christians. The best place to stay sharp and stay vibrant and stay fresh in your faith is around other Christians. And yes, you need to regularly go out and engage the world. You need to be salt and light there, but then you come back together and you get salty again. That's what he's teaching Timothy right now. And he goes on and gives a beautiful description of a teacher who is not quarrelsome or contentious. And as you read this, I know this description reminded us all of Jesus. He's kind and able to teach. And that's really a picture of someone who can rightly handle truth, but they're gently pursuing the teachable. I'm gonna say that again. They're pursuing the teachable. They're not chasing after the unteachable and demanding a debate and a quarrel. Teach the teachable. You're patiently enduring evil. That means you're willing to suffer when other people wrong you, when people critique your teaching or your lifestyle. You don't resent them for it. You just keep loving them and endure that evil. Correcting with gentleness. Again, exposing error refuting errors and teaching truth. And as I read this, I thought that's really where tough love comes from, isn't it? You know, it's this idea that I'm gonna love you and because I love you, I care about you enough to teach you the truth. But with great strength, I'm also gonna draw some boundary lines and say you're not gonna come into our house and lead people to ruin with false teaching. It's tough love demonstrated within the church and within the world. And the eternal reality that motivates Timothy to prepare for usefulness, 
Look at how this passage ends. God may work in the lives of these uh, teachers, these false teachers. He may allow their hearts to be turned. Um, he, you know, earlier they told us their consciences were seared and cauterized. God's saying he can unsear them. He can uncauterize them. He can soften them so that they receive the gospel message and they can actually be released from the snare of Satan. So the eternal reality to focus on here is God is merciful and he saves the souls of men, even the worst of them. You know, Paul started this first letter to Timothy with Jesus Christ saves sinners among whom I am the worst. Saul who persecuted the church, God saved him. God can save the false teachers too. And I love this reality that, you know, Jesus says, once you're mine, you're my possession forever and no one can take you out of my hand. But here we get a picture of somebody who's gotten tangled up in Satan's hand and you know what God says? I can get you out. I can snatch you out of Satan's hand. You who've been useful to Satan, teaching falsely and distorting the gospel, I can save you. What an amazing God is that. He is both merciful and mighty. So what God is showing us here, he's showing Timothy, he uses people in this process of saving souls. He uses us when we teach truth and correct error and live a changed life as a visible reality. We are able to help rescue those who are entrapped by Satan. And so he's telling Timothy, lift your eyes from the arguments and the debates and the conflict and look to eternity because that's where the souls of men live. And they live there either condemned or accepted and saved by God. So how do we take this advice? How do we endure? How do we remain faithful to God? You know, the truth is in America, sometimes we get a little ridicule and harsh treatment because of our views on God and Jesus and life and sexuality. Um, but we certainly aren't suffering like people in other parts of the world are. So does that difference matter? Are there different instructions for how to endure and how to be faithful depending on your circumstances? I don't think so. The same instructions that serve Timothy and the church leaders who came behind him, they would help us the same way they help the addict who's had a hard life in Harlem, the same way they'd help the white woman from Texas who sat there crying with them. These instructions are good for all of us. Look to eternity, look past what you see and what you feel and what's happening right in front of you. Look to what God is doing in the world and let your eyes rest there because God is calling together his people and he's using his word which isn't bound and he's using his church which will stand forever and he's using useful people to proclaim the message that will save souls for all eternity. I want us to close on one verse. I didn't include this in your verse sheet, so just listen. These are Paul's words, 2 Corinthians 4. So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us all an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Let's pray. God, we love you. And we thank you that you have put eternity in our hearts. And so we ask for your help um, to keep eternity in the forefront of our minds, Lord. And all, all the things that we experience in this world, Lord, we just ask that we would keep them in the proper perspective. And we ask that we could look out to the world and desire to be a part of your plan, a part of your faithful progression that moves your word forward and saves souls of men, Lord. That's our prayer and we ask for your help as we do that and we want to do that, Lord, for your glory and your honor. So we ask for your help in Jesus' name, amen.